this uh, uh, font size is large enough. Um, so um, I was saying, I guess, this being a non-commutative um, um, geometry and topology seminar, maybe most of the um, terms on the um, uh, title are clear. Perhaps we're not so familiar with uh, fusion or tensor categories and their actions. Um, so, um, <clears throat> however, I mean, K-theory, AF algebras, uh, actions of, of groups, for instance, is probably um, safe to assume. Let me know if, if I'm assuming something you don't know. I'm happy to give details at any time. Uh, so in this joint work with um, um, uh, Quen Chuan and Corey Jones, basically, um, we managed to put together some tools arising mainly from subfactor theory um, into the classification of a reasonable class of, um, of, of symmetries of A of algebras. So that being said, let me state what the main goal um, goal both of the paper and the talk look like. Um, so the idea is to obtain a computable, not just some abstract um, uh, classification, but we want to classify by a computable K-theoretic invariant. Um, that completely classifies, let's say reasonable, I'll make somewhat more clear what I mean by reasonable later on. Um, and I want to say quantum symmetries uh, or maybe um, UFC actions, unitary fusion category actions on AF algebras. Here, uh, when I speak of quantum symmetries, um, uh, since I'll be speaking again on Friday uh, on this other learning seminar, maybe we can parenthesize the quantum part. Uh, we're not so comfortable with tensor categories and you're completely safe to think about everything I'm gonna say in, in, um, in terms of finite groups. Actually, I'll, 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 I'll give you a, a, an overall uh, landscape view of our paper from uh, the restriction to finite groups. So you don't really need to know um, what fusion categories are. Now, that being said, I do want to stress out the fact that um, the category theory or the tensor category theory, um, even though you don't need to know it well to understand what I'll talk about, are indeed indispensable tools in the proofs. So, so um, um, some tools coming from, from abstract or basic uh, category theory, as well as uh, even techniques from subfactors and tensor categories acting on volume and algebras. Uh, will 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 be um, densely populating uh, the 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 theme today. Um, so um, just keep in mind that these are tools that we cannot longer uh, keep pushing aside. Anyways, um, now this being said, um, let me perhaps make this um, effort I'm asking you to do slightly more appealing, um, and list a couple applications of our classification. So first off, in certain cases, we'll be able to completely um, classify such symmetries, the reasonable ones. Um, and um, I guess another big theme in this, um, uh, or in, in, in my general research project is the following. Um, so there's, there's a very robust classification program for subfactors. There's a very robust now classification program for simple C-star algebras. So it's now the ideal time to start exporting a tool from subfactor theory to C-star algebras. And that's the second application I wanna um, um, talk about, which is to export from subfactors to um, C-star algebras. And uh, the idea is to classify, right here we want to do some type of um, hyperfinite C star algebraic version of, of um, hyperfinite uh, subfactors. Um, so basically if we look at the right class of inclusions of AF algebras inside AF algebras, 
we'll be able to classify them by an extended standard invariant, which includes the, the top part over here. Um, so um, want to classify strongly AF. Uh, inclusions of AFC star algebras by standard invariance. This term standard invariant is um, a technical um, meaningful term coming from subfactor theory. Uh, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, I'm gonna briefly tell you what it is. Um, so, so um, eventually you will will come back to each of these points anyways. Um, now, let me say perhaps um, a few things about quantum symmetries. And again, parenthesize it if you if you must. Um, so the idea is that um, unitary fusion categories um, are mathematical gadgets that uh, encode, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, unitary fusion categories are mathematical gadgets that simultane simultaneously generalize uh, finite groups and their representations. Uh, so when I say fusion category, you can grab your, your favorite finite dimensional group or its representation category, and that's an example of a UFC. Uh, so you're already familiar with a bunch of these. Um, and uh, in general, unitary tensor categories, um, I'll tell you what the difference is in a second, uh, encode um, quantum symmetry, such as the symmetries of subfactors or topological quantum field theories, etc. Um, so unitary fusion categories are a subclass of unitary tensor categories. So basically, um, UFCs are UTCs with finite dimension, uh, sorry, with um, um, finitely many irreducibles, right? So if you take a group and look at its representation category, basically you demand that the number of irreducibles um, or, the, or the set of, of irreducibles forms a finite set. That's what I mean by unitary fusion category. So just to help you remember a mnemonic is F as in finite. Uh, the terminology is not great. So those things are um, uh, useful every now and then. Uh, but I guess the big punchline I wanna draw from all of this is that unitary tensor categories act on operator algebras. Um, namely, uh, we can speak of uh, Volumen algebras and Pister algebras. Um, it's, um, yeah, so I'm not assuming existence of braidings, not to say symmetric, but are they're enriched in some sense. Uh, you're welcome to also attend the, the, the talk on Friday, uh, where, where I'll spell this, this out more. But um, by unitary, I mean you have um, basically your home spaces are Hilbert spaces. That's, that's what it is. No, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, but no. Go ahead. Like it's going to be a tensor, it's going to be a tensor category in the sense of acting off, and then you're enriching it over Hilbert spaces. Uh, yes, yeah. roughly, yes, yes. Uh, no, I mean, um, so so you can think of um, of a symmetry. Maybe mathematically, you would you would. Uh, speak about a, a module for a group or a group action, if you wish. Uh, the group can be finite, infinite, or whatever. Uh, what I'm trying to, to, to sell here is that um, if you really want to study um, symmetry, you will be very limited if you only look at groups. Uh, and uh, again, I'll make that statement more precise later on. Uh, but yeah, here you can have any finite group. You can have even you know the integers. You can have uh, very... Um, very much exotic symmetries as those granted by by um, fusion categories. Um, hopefully, I'll, I'll I'll have time to give you a couple a couple more examples um, if that makes sense. Any more questions in the meantime? Cool. So um, I guess. Um,
And uh, well, examples of um, actions of unitary tensor categories or fusion categories on von Neumann algebras. Well, basically, there's a whole literature on on of, of, about uh, subfactors and their classification. But just to give you perhaps a relevant list of um, uh, literature to to go check if you're interested um, for um, exotic symmetries of C-star algebras. Well, there's um, um, remarkable paper paper by by Izumi in '98. Uh, where he constructs um, actions uh, or symmetries on, on Kuhn's algebras, which do not arise from groups, uh, explicitly constructed here. Uh, well, later on, myself together with uh, Mike Harglas in 2020, show that actually, if you give me any, say, countably generated uh, unitary tensor category, we can craft a simple monotracial unital C star algebra admitting an action of the prescribed um, tensor category. Um, there's also work of um, Corey Jones, for instance, last year, where he shows that even commutative C star algebras admit certain non classical uh, symmetries. Um, and for instance, there's also work of um, Sam Evington together with uh, Sergio Giron Pacheco from published in 21, uh, where basically they show there's actually very interesting K theoretic obstructions to the existence of actions or, or exotic symmetries on C star algebras. And for instance, they study cases of um, where your receptacle algebra is a UHF algebra or the Yangzhou algebra and whatnot. So very interesting papers, all of these, and the list keeps on growing. So um, here's a growing, um, very appealing literature, which I uh, urge you to go uh, look into. Um, now, um, I promise you that I um, will try to demystify the main um, theme of the talk, the classification here. So uh, instead of just talking abstractly about uh, quantum symmetries and actions of tensor categories and whatnot, let me start by carefully reviewing what does it mean for a finite group to act on say a von Neumann or a C star algebra. And I'll show you how to categorify that. I'm not gonna justify immediately why I'm doing that, but I will do it in about 10 more minutes. Um, so. Um, let me just show you how to go from, say, um, automorphic actions to UTC actions in the case of groups, and then I'll, I'll justify me doing that. Um, so, um, example, let me say um, group actions and um, cross products. Um, so ingredients we need here is G be a finite group. Let's say A be um, a unital C star algebra uh, with trivial center, say. You can also take it to one factor. Um, so an action of G and A, typically denoted uh, say G, G acting on A, well, is nothing else that uh, group homomorphism from G into the group of automorphisms of your operator algebra. Um, and well, basically just by the nature of groups, what this is implying immediately is that all of these are invertible symmetries. Um, and once we're given this information, what we can do is to take extensions or cross, uh, cross products. Um, so uh, what information or what extra information do I need to do that? Uh, I need the information of a twisted subgroup. So what that is, is uh, basically a pair H, a subgroup, subgroup of G together with a two co-cycle mu. Um, here I'm taking a normalized two co-cycle. So some um, cohomological data, if you're not super familiar with this, just ignore it. Um, but uh, once you're given this information, basically what you can do is um, to form an extension of A um, into its cross products. And it comes canonically accompanied by a conditional expectation that projects, um, how do I want to write this? 
right, the, the, the Fourier series contained in here to their components over the coefficient algebra. So this will be delta of uh, H equals the identity times AH. Right? That's, that's a canonical conditional expectation that I get out of this. Um, <coughs> now, um, just to show you a sub example of these of these um, of this construction, uh, well, basically, if you have a, a group where a trivial action of any finite group, say on the complex numbers, plus some twisted subgroup H mu. Um, the algebra that you're going to get here on the right hand side is um, well this cross product, which is nothing else than the twisted group algebra C new H. Um, and here, if I have some color chalk, um, maybe this one, um, um, I wanted to make a few remarks. So in greater generality, once we leave the realm of groups, uh, we will see that the data here of a twisted subgroup more generally is um, um, found with very, very many names, but uh, typically people refer to these as Q systems. Um, and um, so we can look at them categorically or we can, we can look at them realized as some concrete um, C star algebra. So what I want to remark from this constructions is that abstract Q systems are generalizations of finite dimensional C star algebra. Also, by, by kind of uh, carrying out this elementary example, I want to bring in um, the main characters that play a role in all this uh, business around here. So hopefully this is clear so far. Um, yeah. I mean, really know mm -hmm. these twisted things. How can I think about these two cosides? What information will get in? Um, so these, these kind of um, exist at different levels. So group cohomology is some type of graded um, uh, structure. Um, and somehow depending on the grading, graded component you are at, uh, you can interpret it in different ways. Um, Basically here, this condition of being a two co cycle manifests itself as saying, after you take a cross product construction, what you get out of it is an associative algebra. So in some sense, this, 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 uh, this um, second graded component measures obstruction to extending your, your, your algebras to, to larger associative algebras by the information you already given. Um, of course, for instance, you can also go to the third graded component and that's going to have a different interpretation. Um, and I guess uh, the more of a psychopath you become, the more you can you can interpret the higher grading uh, or, or, or the higher parts of the of the cohomology. Um, but um, as far as the second one goes, that's that's what I can tell you. Um, so you can you can just perhaps grab a two co chain that doesn't satisfy the, the vanishing condition and what you're going to get out of that is 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 not so very nice. Yes. Yes. So, so, um, um, what I'm getting from your comment is basically you can regard this over algebra as a bundle over the small algebra. That's right. That's a way to view it. Um, anyway, so um, let's try and categorify this setting here. And uh, morally, I guess, um, what we're trying to do here is to take attention away from points. Right, so here, whenever I write a group action, right, basically, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I imagine I'm, I'm, I'm capable of following the orbits of, of objects with my finger, right? Like this is a set theoretic construction where I can tell where each point goes. Um, let's get rid of that, right? Let's, let's not be able to speak about, um, say, the internal structure 
of of our, of, of our algebra, right? Like let, let's not um, take advantage of that by taking attention away from points and um, try to see if we're still able to capture all of this, right? Is, is this really point? So in order to categorify this left-hand side, uh, well, of course, we cannot talk about groups, right? Because a group is a set with some structure. So what we will construct is a category um, of finite dimensional G graded Hilbert spaces. So let me tell you what this is. Um, well, first off, this is an example of a unitary fusion category, right? Just by virtue of my group being finite. Uh, so what this is, is well, categories come in two layers, objects and morphisms. So the objects are the finite dimensional G graded Hil uh, Hilbert spaces. So H, you'll be able to decompose as a sum over G of say finite dimensional HGs. And uh, well, if you choose a one dimensional uh, generating space over each graded component, you'll also be able to decompose this um, as some direct sum of copies of CG, say NG copies of CG over each G, right? So those are the objects of, of uh, Hill GF and the morphisms are just um, G graded linear transformations. Um, so basically what I'm saying here is that the home spaces from, let's say the, the G basic graded component to uh, CH is basically isomorphic to uh, delta um, Kronecker delta G equals H times the complex numbers. So, um, so um, this is a very simple uh, fusion category to deal with, but it's the first uh, and, and, and easiest way of categorifying a group. Um, so, so far we know what to do with this. Let's figure out what to do with, uh, with a group action in categorical terms. So let's say second, um, we will have to renounce this nice group of invertible symmetries for something much thicker. Um, so what we, um, what we do here is to replace this receptacle by the tensor category of finitely generated projective modules over A. Um, so basically these are, um, um, I said modules, I meant by modules, um, right? So these are spaces admitting commuting left and right actions of A and also admitting bases both on the left and right. Um, and right, yes. Another way to say it is also uh, dualizable uh, morphisms here. Uh, sorry, dualizable uh, by modules here. Um, so let me let me put this in in plain English. So this is the tensor category of um, FGP right and left um, C star AA correspondences. Um, for those of you feeling more technical than that, um, and uh, well. Finally, once we have a receptacle, let's write down what the action should be. Uh, not necessarily, but in some sense, you have a notion of a right and left dimensions, and I'm just demanding both of them be finite. That's, that's what it is. Uh, they can be different. Um, sometimes they can be normalized to match, uh, but as long as they're finite, that's okay. Uh, so um, we've categorified this. This, um, well, this right, uh, um, this automorphism, uh, automorph automorphism part, let's do the whole thing. Um, so now the action itself, this homomorphism, will be just some tensor functor from Hill FG um, into um, them FGPA. Um, now, what I need to the to demand of this functor is, uh, let me call it F if I must, is to demand that F is compatible with the tensor structures of both a source and target, right? So I'll just, I'll just denote that by that little symbol over there. And explicitly what I can do is to map the simple G graded component CG to the bi module, let me say, um, little GA, if you wish, right? So this is an A, A bi module. And if you wish, um, the actions 
say if you have a vector C and GA and you have um, actually uh, and you have A and A prime acting on each side of, of C, what this will become is um, uh, let me make sure I don't get this wrong. Yeah. So this is G inverse of A times C times A prime. Yeah, so here this multiplication is just the, the multiplication in the algebra. As all I'm saying is that GA is A as a vector space. Um, so um, voila, we've categorified a group action um, using the language of unitary tensor categories. Um, now, um, before I forget, I need to add to this the data, uh, the coherence data. And this comes as a price we pay uh, for kind of removing points away from the theory, right? So I'm not any more able to check that objects A and B are equal. That doesn't make sense or too much sense in category theory. Uh, um, so what I need to make sure is, uh, well, what do I mean uh, by saying that F is compatible with the tensor structures? So I need ways of comparing, let's say, the action or the tensor product of FCG and, and FCH with um, the action of F on the tensor product of um, CG times CH. And by the way, I forgot to say here, um, the tensor structure in help C is given by, well, if you multiply CG by CH, you will get the H, the GH graded component. Um, I forgot to mention this before. Anyways, um, um, just to make sure that F is compatible with both the left and right structures, um, I need to endow it with a family of, um, of morphisms. This is a, a natural isomorphism, uh, which has components, um, let me call this F2GH, um, sort of comparing um, the possible ways in which I can form these products. Um, Yes, yes. So this is basically saying that uh, F is a monoidal form. So that's how you categorify a group action. Um, this uh, blackboard is, is, is it fine to use? Maybe not. Uh, Say again? I, just, I never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, this. Okay, so now let me just say that, um, um, I guess I've justified uh, or I've um, maybe shown you how uh, group actions fit into this picture. Let me talk a little bit more about unitary tensor categories in nature. So there's uh, several ways of producing these. So from groups, we've learned that we have um, the finite dimensional G graded. Um, we can also twist these categories by introducing um, a twist W here. Um, and let me just point out what W uh, or omega here is. Um, this is basically a three co-cycle. Um, and this condition, um, uh, if you're wondering, arises as part of the um, um, pentagon axioms that need to be satisfied as part of the definition of a tensor category. So um, that's all I'm, I'm going to say um, about that right now. Of course, you can also take um, the representations of a finite group, and that's, uh, well, in particular, all of these are going to be fusion categories. Um, you can also produce unitary tensor categories by looking at um, discrete quantum groups. Um, so basically, the main tool here is um, uh, Tanaka Klein reconstruction. So every time you take such a quantum group, you can correspond this uh, via Tanaka Klein to um, fiber functors out of 
the tensor category of finite dimensional representations of G. And by fiber functors, I mean monoidal functors from this in general UTC uh, into the finite dimensional uh, or the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Um, so um, perhaps rather abstractly, one can make correspond compact quantum groups uh, to, to uh, unitary tensor categories in this way. Um, and finally, perhaps, oh, by the way, I meant to say these in the literature are named fiber functors. Um, and perhaps closer to my heart is um, how to obtain tensor categories out of subfactors. Right, so recall that um, a subfactor is an inclusion, a unital inclusion of simple volume and algebras. Um, so typically, I'd like to start with a type two one factor, so n with its unique trace, unitally embedded into another um, uh, volume and factor. Um, so let me say here, this is a type two one subfactor. Um, and the way to produce a, a tensor category out of this is via the standard invariant, which I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning. And perhaps the most operator algebraic uh, way to cast for this standard invariant is via uh, the lattice of higher relative commutants. Yeah, so the idea is here, um, be able to construct a tower of inclusion. So you have N inside M, you do some von Neumann um, magic here and uh, somehow mimic this uh, extension here into another larger von Neumann factor M1 and you get M1 and M2 and so forth. I'm not gonna give details about that, um, but basically the standard invariant um, is constructed by looking at the relative commutants of the smaller algebras into the inside the bigger pieces of the tower. Technically, that's known as, a, as the Jones Tower, uh, and the tool there is the Jones basic construction. Um, um, well, in interest of time, I'm not going to say much more about this part. Um, basically, I'll just mention that uh, there's been a lot of work into understanding subfactors from different perspectives. Um, and for instance, there's the work of Ognianu introducing pair groups to study subfactors in the late 80s. Uh, there's work of Popa, which more heavily um, studies um, lambda lattices or um, lattices of high relative commutants of subfactors. Uh, there's also uh, planar algebras by Jones, um, if you're familiar with the graphical calculus and whatnot, um, and also. Um, there's a formulation of the standard invariant by Michael Muger in 23, which is the one that we're going to adopt, which is based on Q systems. Um, so um, I think I'll finally need to erase um, maybe, maybe here so that I don't flip this again. Okay, so um, let me dig deeper into this formalism of, uh, or, or dig deeper into studying subfactors via their standard invariants, a la Muger. So if we start with a finite depth, type two one subfactor, I'll tell you what this finite depthness condition means in just a second. Um, well, the standard invariant, uh, according to, to Muger, um, is the following information. So you start with a Q system Q, which you construct as follows. So basically you just uh, view the over factor M as a bimodule over the sub factor N. Um, you have to do some type of Hilbert space um, 
completion with respect to the uh, to the trace here, the GNS construction plays a role and whatnot. But the idea is basically roughly just view M as an N N by module. Um, and this somehow behaves similarly as a twisted subgroup um, that I think I conveniently just erased. Um, I didn't. Um, so so uh, these two things somehow hold the same information. Um, not obviously though. Um, and then to, to uh, keep full record of what the standard invariant is, you also need to um, look for the tensor category uh, of all finitely generated by modules uh, lying under L2M. Now the intuition here is uh, maybe if you're familiar with the Peter Weil theorem for a locally compact group, uh, the idea there, or, or, or maybe the punchline there is that you can decompose L2G as a sum of uh, finite dimensional representations appearing with very um, distinctive multiplicities, right? Um, but the idea is L2G becomes a sum of finite dimensional representations. And that's the decomposition we're gonna do here. Right? So we're gonna record all of the finite dimensional irreducibles appearing here, and that's gonna form a tensor category. Um, right? Um, so in other words, it's a tensor category generated by by uh, repeated tensor products of, of Q, right? So you can form Q, tensor Q, tensor Q, and so on, and decompose. Um, so here you obtain a tensor category by looking at um, um, sums, direct sums, tensor products, and taking um, uh, what's the terminology, the um, conjugate representation, if you're familiar with representation theory, or by taking duals, that's another way to put it. Um, <coughs> And basically, once you record this information, um, uh, what you've done is effectively embedded um, the category you, you generated into the category of finally generated projective bimodules um, over N. Uh, so that's the standard invariant Alamuger. Um, and the finite depthness condition here basically tells me that this guy here is finite yep so we say a, 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 a type 2 one sub factor is finite depth if and only if it's standard invariant it's essentially finite that's what it means um now um once i've brought this way of producing uh, examples of tensor categories and their actions let me address the question why category five my group actions already worked pretty well, so why touch them? Um, well, maybe not so much. Um, let me speak about Jones index. Um, and uh, the best way to read about this is this Inventionist paper by him um, published on 83. Um, so basically the idea of Jones index is um, is some type of measurement on how much bigger is M with respect to N, right? So it's, it's a measure of the size of M as an N module. How many, how many times can N uh, or, or how many copies of N do you need to saturate M? That's, that's uh, roughly the meaning of it. Um, so the notation is, um, inherited from the index of a subgroup. Um, and it, it's this notion of, um, of a von Neumann dimension, right? Um, M, um, yeah, I said it like M viewed as an, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. The dimension of M as, an, as a right N module. Um, well, and um, this number was, was interesting for many reasons. I guess people suspected already or, or knew already that this von Neumann dimension or this index was allowed to vary continuously between one and infinity um, until Jones showed them all wrong. He said, okay, there is a spectrum where this thing is allowed to vary continuously, uh, but it's not all numbers from one to infinity. The range of values where this thing can live is the following.
once you reach four, okay, you, you, you get that uh, plasticity if you wish. Uh, but the, the lower um, values of the index are very much quantized. Um, and this is what uh, basically opened the doors to the modern theory of subfactors, right? Um, this was a very surprising finding. Um, and uh, well, I guess now the observation I want to make is with respect to this question over here. Um, well, um, oh, and I forgot to say, and saturated all these values. Right, so it's not only that the, the this dimension is restrained to this index, he actually constructed a subfactor for each value of the index. Now the observation is, well, what happens if I look at subfactors arising as cross products by actions of groups, right? So if we do, let's say N cross product by some group H and look at this index, what we will get is a natural number. Well, maybe let me say the group is finite. Um, so all we get is a natural number. So most symmetries are invisible to groups. That's the need to categorify. That's exactly it. So um, most uh, symmetries are invisible to groups. That's a lesson we learned from 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 Jones, among others. Um, Yep. Um, so, loosely speaking, um, you want to view this is this is a this is a non-commutative Galois theory, right? So, so basically, uh, you replace your field of scalars by by some type of operator algebra, and then view how much bigger is m with respect to n. And the idea here is once I do this, right? Maybe I, I'm able to decompose m as something that contains n copies, little n copies of big N, plus perhaps some projective piece, right? So the value of the index will be this n plus a trace of P. And that's what it is. Yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I think I will need to erase now and, and let me just jump into the, content of the paper. Um, Let me now talk about quantum symmetries of AF algebras. So I'm shifting my scope from von Neumann factors to, to unital AF algebras. All of these algebras I, I care about today are unital. Uh, well, we know to start with that AF algebras are classified by K theory. Basically, all you need is um, A naught of A, um, it's positive cone. And the class of the of the unit in K um, in K theory, um, and this is the um, this is famous work by Elliot in the seventies. Um, and um, well, I guess later on, people like uh, Kishimoto, um, Ole Bratelli, Elliot himself, uh, David Evans. I'm not going to write all of those down uh, in interest of time. Uh, started thinking and and uh, achieved some partial results into classifying the symmetries of these algebras. Um, however, maybe somehow they had to restrict to the type of groups acting on the algebras, maybe cyclic groups, maybe Z2. Uh, maybe um, we need to assume that there exists a very particular finite dimensional filtration of my algebra on what, of, of, or whatnot. Um, so um, basically we took those, um, um, initial results as, as um, 
inspiration for achieving a more robust classification. Um, so the task that um, we set ourselves to solve um, um, basically was to classify actions, the reasonable ones, um, uh, let me say up to co-cycle conjugacy. Um, I don't want to say again, in interest of time, what the co-cycle conjugacy means, uh, but this is not an unreasonable um, condition whenever people try to classify symmetries. Um, uh, typically finer or classification with respect to finer invariants is uh, too difficult to be um, achievable. Um, so the tool that we developed is a K-theoretic invariant. And in the minutes remaining, what I want to do is write down in plain English what this invariant is. Then I'll write down what it formally is uh, and see how much further uh, we can take it from there. So what, the, uh, what, what constructs uh, this invariant is a finite list of um, ordered building groups. And uh, positive uh, morphisms connecting them. Yeah, so um, say if we fix a fusion category or a finite group, if you wish, acting on my AF algebra um, A, uh, the composition law um, ruling these um, positive homomorphisms comes from the category C with uh, composition law coming from C. This is the invariant. Um, so um, let me write it down. Um, so to an action F of C on A, we associate the pair F hat and the class of the unit uh, where F hat is the following functor, right? So I'm, I'm gonna write down formally what this list is. So this is um, a functor from the category of Q systems, all the twisted subgroups of the category modulo isomorphism, right? You can, for instance, take uh, H subgroup of G and look at, at, at its uh, conjugates. All of those are gonna be equivalent. Um, and this is a functor into the category of pre-ordered um, abelian groups. And basically what you do here is, okay, I'm gonna take a Q system Q and I'm gonna map it to, well, I'm gonna compute the K, uh, the K theory of the cross product by Q. And I'm gonna keep record of the positive cone. Um, that's what the invariant is. Now, I haven't told you what this um, abstract cross product is, uh, but uh, since I gave you the example of what it is for groups, I'm hoping this is okay. Right? This is just some, some generalized cross product construction. If your C happens to be a finite group, you know what it is. So uh, basically what the invariant is doing, what F hat is doing is recording the K theory of all possible ways of, of extending um, A by the action F. That's what the invariant is. Um, and um, perhaps in the last few minutes, in the last five minutes or so, I'll tell you why this works uh, and what I mean by reasonable class of actions. Any questions whatsoever? Yes, it's the Watatani index. Yes, uh, I can give you more reference at the end. Happy to talk about it. Um, right, so I, I'm, I'm not going to write it down, but um, um, 
basically you can interpret what um, this part here means in the case where C is a finite group. Um, um, well, basically you just take or record the K theory of all possible cross products by all possible twisted subgroups of G. That's what the invariant is. Um, so um, the idea behind the, this invariant is to, um, well, first, um, let me just tell you perhaps a uh, reverse engineer this invariant here, how did we come up with this? Uh, well, the first thing that you want to do is to come up with the simplest K-theoretic invariant that completely classifies actions of fusion categories on finite dimensional C star algebras, right? Because eventually you will want to Elliott intertwine the heck out of it and be able to, to preserve the property of being an invariant. So that is the first step that you need to make sure of. Um, so, that completely classifies um, C acting on finite dimensional. Um, and basically the proof that our invariant does this, um, I'm just gonna throw in some last, name, last names here, is um, a consequence of the Yoneta lemma Remember at the beginning of the talk, I told you we could not dispense the categories. And this is a very surprising appearance actually. Uh, but the proof is the Yoneta lemma playing the role of the lifting lemma uh, from Elliott classification together with a functorial version of Yolt's um, theorem, right? The theorem that relates the equivariant K theory with the, with the K theory of the cross product. And this uh, version of Joel's lemma is afforded by Ostrick theorem, which is uh, um, another result um, from category theory that basically parametrizes uh, the modules of the category in terms of internal, um, basically in terms of the twisted subgroups of the category, the Q systems. Um, um, so this is what allows us to afford this first uh, finite dimensional step. And then the second one um, is, um, will basically show that property, the pro let's say property one is preserved um, in the limit, right? So um, say whenever you have um, an AF algebra, um, basically, um, what do I want to say here? Um, um, we need to make sure, we need to carefully make sure that the property of being a complete invariant passes on um, to, to, um, to inductive limits, right? Uh, as you construct A from a finite dimensional filtration. Um, and maybe this is a good point to introduce um, what I mean by reasonable symmetry. So we need to restrict to AF actions, right? So once you restrict to AF actions, I'll tell you what these are in a second, uh, you can easily ensure the second property. So what is an AF action? What is this reasonable class of symmetry? Well, basically you say that a symmetry or an action is AF if your algebra admits a finite dimensional filtration such that um, the action of C restricts to the finite dimensional blocks nicely. Um, so once you do that, um, basically it's just a matter of checking um, that F hat is a complete invariant uh, in satisfying both um, both points over here. Um, yep. Not automatic. Um, there are symmetries which aren't of this form. Definitely. However, um, I don't think it's to be expected that those symmetries are classifiable by K-theoretic means. So, so um, yes, there's a trade-off for that. Um, so, um, well, I guess this is the idea and a rough um, two-minute sketch of the proof on how 
F hat, uh, this invariant classifies all AF actions on unital AF algebras. Um, and uh, how much longer do I have? Okay, so um, maybe I can take four. Um, um, so after establishing this, perhaps let me just talk about, uh, briefly talk about the applications, um, which I haven't discussed yet. So, um, um, so I promise that there are certain cases where our invariant gives, gives a, um, um, a complete classification of all AF symmetries. Um, and the, pardon me, the case is the following. So if C is the Fibonacci category, um, this category is the following. So you have two simple objects, the monoidal unit and tau, right? And this is called the Fibonacci category because if you take the tensor product of tau with itself, what you get uh, is this decomposition. This already uh, disposes vector spaces. You cannot represent this using vector spaces. Uh, so this is a genuine um, fusion category that you will not be able to realize using Hilbert spaces. Um, so this thing basically uh, has a nice property that um, has only one Q system, namely um, um, just a tensor unit. Um, this is typically found in the literature as torsion free. Right, so uh, a fusion category is torsion free if and only if uh, it has essentially one Q system. Um, well, and basically here, if you look at um, A phi being um, the C star algebra whose K theory or, or the AF C star algebra whose K, th K theory is Z plus phi Z where, where uh, Phi here is a golden ratio. Um, well, basically, our classification um, implies that there exists a unique um, um, action of Fib on the Fibonacci AF algebra. Um, so this is very nice. There's only one AF symmetry on of. Um, of fifth on the fifth AF algebra. And um, well, the last application that I wanted to show is um, perhaps this can go now, is how um, tensor categories and subfactors give back to C star algebra. So using our K theoretic invariant, we're able to classify the following. Um, so um, let's say A inside B is a unital inclusion of uh, AF C star algebras. Um, what else do I need with trivial centers? All right, so I will be able to parametrize these AF analogs of subfactors um, in terms of an extended standard invariant. Uh, which consists of the following. So of course I will need a Q system, which can be constructed by regarding B as an AA by module. Um, I record uh, the fusion category generated by this Q system um, together with the embedding. I'll leave more space together with the embedding. Um, I get by doing this. Um, and I append our K theoretic invariant to this. Um, so um, basically by appending subfactory type of information 
with C star algebraic or K theoretic type of information uh, or data, I'll be able to parametrize uh, these AF subfactors uh, as long as basically um, this inclusion is what we named as strongly F, but not just any inclusion, but one inclusion such that um, whenever you look at all the AA by modules supported in this inclusion, all of them can be approximated simultaneously by finite dimensional data. Um, and this is the last application that I wanted to show you. Um, I, think, I think this is all I wanted to say today. Thank you very much. Even aware of uh, your CMD such that C is a subcategory, uh, tensor subcategory of D. So, is there other analogs of induced and restricted actions? Um, Generalizing this in the context of groups. I mean, typically, for instance, if you do things like, um, I mean, this is not a satisfactory answer to your question, I think, but you can induce from, from say, an A representation to a B representation, say, by tensoring, um, um, by this by module, for instance. This is this is a concrete implementation of the of the induction functor, I guess more familiar from the uh, group case. But uh, I'm guessing your question goes more in the um, in the direction of like if you have C acting on A and D, an enlargement of C, um, will it also act on A? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know of a, of a clean way or systematic way of doing this. Uh, um, yeah, maybe we can discuss we we can discuss later. But uh, off the top of my head, I'm 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 not sure there's a clean way of doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering. This is a what. <laughs> so uh, you've got like uh, your fusion categories, and of course, two because it's just the same as contact quantum to flow free contact quantum and elastic field. So the, the mapping of the generalizing functor from the, the fusion category, the tensor category, into the category of void mass, is it is that going to be somehow the same thing or more general as an action or force in the contact quantum field, flow free contact quantum field, and etc.? Um, so, so what is the question again? Then, so could, could, could you do the same thing or is this more general than instead of, okay, so we, we, we saw that if you look at symmetries with respect to groups, there aren't enough. So one should look for something more general. So something more general would be an action or coaction of a compact quantum group. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're looking at here instead are a kind of actions or embeddings of tensor categories into your modular categories. They look like they should be two versions of the same thing. Uh, not quite. Um, so so the formally an action, right? So, so for a quantum group, right? What I wrote was, this corresponds to to some type of uh, fiber functor um, down to help uh, in an action, um, say uh, C acting on A uh, is basically the same as a tensor functor, a monoidal functor from C 
into BMA. Um, so, so really what you get is, is, is that relation. So, so um, this setting of, of quantum symmetries um, really engulfs um, the fiber functor formalism. Uh, and basically just because there are examples of tensor categories, here's one, which do not admit fiber functors. So, so uh, it's much, much broader than just uh, discrete quantum groups. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's surprisingly easy to come up with uh, examples, even the, the, for instance, the held, um, the held G omega categories do not admit basically by construction a fiber functor to help. Uh, so, so you really get a much larger universe there. If, if that answers your that's, question. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was just wondering whether you can do something similar, not for AI, but AI. <laughs> What's AI? <laughs> uh, approximately integral algebra. So you're building lots of time dimensional algebra with continuous functions from the integral to finite dimensional algebra. Ah, I see. Um, I mean, possibly this. Uh, um, um, A short answer is I, I don't know, but um, one of the reason I'm, um, reasons I'm very interested in coming here and talking to the classifiers uh, is maybe uh, appealing to that type of question, right? So, so like, what is the next thing to do? Should we go, maybe you're saying AI, maybe AT, maybe um, purely infinite, maybe something different. Uh, we don't know, basically we're, we, we, we want to present this as a proof of concept. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, this is, this is kind of brand new. Um, so, so um, um, Hopefully, um, we can we can um, get some dialogue going, and uh, maybe we can find a reasonable next step. Yeah, yeah. So I have yeah. another question, which I, I have no idea whether it's really correlated, but just reminds me. This is the question of Blackada that I've been thinking about lately. It's in Jose back in the eighties. Is you have uh, a group, let's say a cyclic group, acting on the K zero, the order K theory. Of an AF algebra, and you lift it to perfection actually on the algebra. So if you have something, let's say, let's just say an order two, something that flips K3 somehow, can you find an order two what more from the algebra? I'm just wondering whether you're sort of, is this, it's known in some cases that you can't do this, like uh, Gabon and Celtic, well, like they have under certain circumstances, you can do this kind of lift. But I'm just wondering with your kind of more general structure, you can kind of attack that. So um, yes, I guess I guess your 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 question is really sensitive to to initial parameters. I guess depends on um, even the type of algebra, the type of action, um, and I guess it's kind of deceiving because you can choose the simplest group, you can you can and still get very pathological type of uh, behavior. Um, so so I would say in general no. Um, here, for instance, we were able to do such things um, by really putting together um, a category theory, um, I guess, or tensor category theory, interacting with um, um, all this framework of Elliott intertwining. Um, but um, I guess, and even uh, connecting to your previous question, our approach is really naive. Um, and what do I mean by this is, I guess it's, 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 it's somewhat cheap, right? Like just, just find for the simplest thing that works in finite dimensional, um, then restrict your attention to, to a large enough class uh, such that you can pass on to limits. Uh, and why do we do that? Because we need to make, it, uh, we need to make sure that we can lift uh, from K theory to, to, to say hums at the C star level. Um, and that works basically because we're dealing, we're, we're constructed to the finite or the fusion category realm. Um, more general categories, I don't know. Um, more general C star algebras, perhaps if, 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 if they have a nice inductive limit presentation, uh, right? Because everything is an inductive limit in a very perhaps a savage way. But if you have a decent way of presenting your algebra inductively, there might be something to do. Um, but uh, maybe it's a case by case thing. Um, yeah, good question though. Um, 
we, we should talk, talk more about, about this, definitely, yeah. What's happening? Uh, the category, uh, your fusion category comes from not finite group, in not discrete group, but uh, groups. Um, yeah, so, so, so for instance, um, you, you can still um, take the um, tensor category of finite dimensional representations. You need to ensure you restrict to the finite dimensional ones, and then you'll get a nice um, a nice um, representation theory where you can find uh, you can do direct sums, tensor products, find duals, and whatnot. So that is that is uh, the difference is that the list of irreducibles is going to be infinite, most likely. Not not just finitely many irreps, but maybe a very uh, a much longer list. Okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, sure. But I mean, uh, it's all interpretations in terms. Of Hmm. The, the 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 methods would break down. Uh, so if you if you have a an infinite list of, of irreducibles, if your category is, is not fusion, the methods break down. Uh, so sometimes somehow finiteness is of course this uh, compactness condition. So it allows you to exhaust, um, say, a search. Um, so the methods would break down. Um, maybe if you have some nice approximation property or something like this as your as your category acts on its modules, um, you could say something, but uh, this is really dependent on, on finiteness of the categories. What if it's for example finitely generated? So for a set of objects and then you get steps on it. Very good question. I don't know. I would need to examine the 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 proofs in detail. Um, let me see if uh, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I would need to think about it. Um, but um, maybe my gut feeling is the same uh, conclusion would hold that the methods break, but I don't know for a fact. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? I have a quick question just about these cross products. Mm -hmm. um, would they um, cover things like the, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Abedi, Excel, Eilers, construction of a cross product by Z, by bimodules, and then more generally, there's notions of product systems of bimodules, or, or even the maybe section of section algebras of bell bundles. You could sort of think of it as a cross product by bimodules. I wonder, would these be? Covered by this? Mm, so I don't I don't know most of the uh, adjectives you, you put forward, but uh, I'm I'm familiar with this uh, like cross product construction by by Excel like semi group cross product construction. I'm not sure if that's uh, not quite. I mean, so instead of taking just an automorphism of the algebra, they take a, a hundred like, bimodule and they construct it using that boils down to the regular cross product by an work of your by module is just like ah. singly generated. So, uh, so, so what if the what if what if it's just endomorphic? Uh, um, I mean these things are still invertible in the sense they're by module. So hmm. okay, I, I can maybe uh, tell you what I mean. Yes, yes. I'd love to. Is there any other quick questions? Otherwise maybe we can harass you after the talk. Um, or, please do. <laughs> all right, so thank you again very much. Great talk. Thank you for coming. And next week, we have Maro speaking. And I just put up the thing, but I have See you next week. <laughs>